I'm assuming a lot of the times you're meeting with someone that has been brought into the juvenile detention for the first time. You might even be meeting with them on the first or second day or third day. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah. Within the first week, for sure. Sometimes and, the first day, maybe, you know, whenever we get back in the, but definitely within the first week. And what are some of the common themes? What do you hear? I mean, I would assume uh, there's, they're scared. Is that mm -hmm. a being there? And yeah, a lot of sure. Unknowns? Naturally, the uh, majority of them are scared. It's kind of shock and awe, like, oh, this is real, you know? And so it's not like it's a scary facility, a scary place to be. But sometimes it can be, it's definitely scary for the youth, you know, because they're away from home. They're in an environment they have no idea about. The same rules they came from at home are not the same rules they got to deal with inside facilities. Uh, most of these kids that come from the streets and from homes that don't have boundaries and rules, they come into a place, now there's boundaries, now there's rules. You need to listen, there's a bedtime, there's a time when you actually eat, there's a time when you, you have to go to the bathroom, you're going to shower, you're going to go to school. And so it's it's a whirlwind almost. It's a shocker for a lot of these kids because of that. Is it true to say that some of them are, are actually experiencing withdrawal and, and maybe under medical supervision at that time in the first few weeks if that they if yeah, they use drugs? Um, so I would say, yeah, so withdrawals would typically come from heroin. You mm -hmm. know, you know, alcohol is obviously the worst thing to withdraw from, yeah. but. I see kids that are w w typically or in the most, juveniles most. from 14 to 17. I don't see tons of of that, mm -hmm. of the withdrawals from the heroin because maybe they haven't made it to that yet. 18 to 24, now it's a whole different ballgame. You know, I, I work with a lot of youth that are encountering withdrawals. And so they are getting, they're either going to detoxes. If they're in a adult facility, they are getting treated for that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So Typically, I may not see, if the, especially in the adult facility, I won't see them for that first week because for the first week, they're going to be in the infirmary getting treated for the withdrawals and stuff like that before they're okay to go out into regular general population. Sure. But inside the juvenile facilities, I don't deal with anybody withdrawn from the heroin and stuff like that. You don't see that right. a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. What is the process, you know, when you're meeting with someone that has just gone into the juvenile detention center, what is, where do you start? When you first meet with them, yeah. what's the process? So I just go up and introduce myself to them. You know, a lot of, you know, these, you have to win the trust of these, of these youth otherwise. Mm -hmm. And so um, I really have no agenda. I just go in just to, my goal is to really try to um, kind of bring some peace within the, within their own chaos and their own little world. Just letting them know, hey, look, man, I know it seems bad, but it's, it's going to be okay. Um, and just talk and build a relationship. This is where I think my story comes in because I'm like, you know, I've, I've been there. Mm -hmm. I've been where you're at. And it is like, and then it is perk up like, oh, okay. And then I'll start to say, hey, look, you know, what's going on with court? You know, when you're going back to court, you know, one thing we do is court advocacy. If you work with us, there's something we can help. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, and then they have a ton of questions about court and then I'll answer all their questions and, you know, the terminology. And then you just start to see them kind of relax a little bit. So throughout the years, you must have picked up so so much information just on the legal world, oh, which yeah. I'm sure it's not something you necessarily thought of when you first started working. But but now it's like secondhand. Now, you know, it's, now, yeah, it's like another language, right? Now yeah. you're just a few steps away from passing the bar. Almost, yeah, right? I'm just thinking about yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so okay, that's interesting. So I, that, yeah, so you know when you when you can kind of because there's a, they have a lot of confusion going on in mm -hmm. their minds. You know, it's mm -hmm. a whole new world that they just come came into. The court system's brand new, uh, and you know it's it's fearful. You know, it's like oh, you could be doing this amount of time. This, what's this mean? What's that mean? And so you're coming in and you're just bringing clarity into their world, and it just naturally just brings down the peace. You know, and just explain this is how it works in here. This is how. And um, it helps them out. So, you, and then I call, then I say, hey, look, if you want, you know, I try to always build a relationship with the parents too. Well, I was just about to ask you, do you meet yeah. with the parents I think it's all super, the time? Or? As, as much as I, as much as the parents are willing. Mm -hmm. So every youth I come in contact with, I always ask them, you want me to call mom or dad, whoever's at home? I think they'd appreciate knowing that somebody's in your corner. And so, um, and I'll contact just about every, but a lot of times, unfortunately, you deal with parents that are addicts themselves and they really don't care. Oh, I go to court for him, you know, and it's like, but then you do have parents that do care and like they're, they're super appreciative that 
you not only help with the youth, but you're also working with them as well. And so I develop long relationships with the parents, with the families, because I think the more you can encompass everybody, it's going to be better off for the youth and mm-hmm. stuff. Because mm-hmm. the parents, you know, they get, they go through it too. You know, everybody thinks, oh, it's the youth that are doing time with some of the whole family does time with them. And so, and the family feels shame too. It's like, you know, like I, I know I'd feel like if my son started going, do, I'm like, you know, you, you naturally would think that looks bad on you. What did I do wrong as the parent? You know, it's because that's the way it's kind of communicated subconsciously. Like everybody like, oh, look at that kid's kid. You know, what did they do wrong? You know, like I can't believe it. Oh, it's not, I'm not surprised the way he turned out the way it is. You know, do you know his mother? Or, you know, and so. So for the parents, for those parents, and, and I'm assuming also grandparents and sure. uncles and yeah. other people that want to get involved in their life. What could you tell them? What would you tell them? I mean, first of all, not to be ashamed of it. It's mm-hmm. uh, it's not your fault. And to communicate it, you know, like just get people around you that's going to help support you in this process, you know, learn about the process. And also a lot of times when, you know, if somebody gets locked up or they do something, of course you're going to be frustrated as a parent. Of course you're going to be angry. I said, but when you continue to stay in a posture like that, mm-hmm. of being angry towards your kids, to being judgmental or just like, you know, this, this tough love, I believe it only separates you mm-hmm. from them. And so how do you stay in your kid's life with love? Also, you know, I'm not saying be without boundaries or consequences. That's not what I'm saying. But how do you continue to stay in your child's life and support them and love them through this process and have conversations and, and try to figure out like what's really going on in their life rather than making assumptions, you know, like, sure. oh, I know why he's doing this. Or, oh, why don't you ask them what's going on, you mm-hmm. know? And, and how can you support them during their time in, in lockup and then as they come home as well? How, how can you support during the time in lockup? What do, what do you do? Yeah, I think the best thing for, you talk for me or parents? Uh, for for family members, parents. I think the, the best thing to support them while, while they're in lockup is to go in and, you know, um, to visit, mm-hmm. to visit them as much. The kids need it. They need to know they're loved. Okay. And so the be- any way that you can to show them that you love them, communicate them. Don't just assume that they think that you know them. Like you need to let them know that you love them and that you're there for them. And, and even as awkward as it may be, have those conversations with them, you know, and, and support them through the whole time and and try to be. And, and also, I think uh, a lot of times I see a lot of parents, they don't really know how to support them. They think if I just do this, this, it's kind of like enabling them. Uh, so I think tr- maybe getting some type of, there's resource inside these facilities. Like a lot of times in these juvenile facilities, what they'll do is they'll offer like family counseling so everybody mm-hmm. can do it together. Mm-hmm. Engage in those, jump in those. Mm-hmm. But when people hear counseling, they say, oh, there's something wrong with me. But you know, it's like jumping yeah, in and learn something. Right? Still, yeah, that stigma still, even in 2019, right. that stigma still. Mm-hmm is there isn't it yeah absolutely unbelievable yeah Yeah, that's too bad it is too bad because it's a i think it's a fantastic resource even me um in the work that i do i i have to meet with somebody just to kind of be able to process all my feelings and stuff like that you know so i need counseling this job too to to sustain long term how many children do you meet with on average i mean you know whether it's on a week or by month well i'd say on a weekly basis just here in like the essex county area where we we um uh work and when i say work and this is not you know we i'd say 150 175 youth a year just you know mm-hmm. really just work so with it's them. gonna it's gonna have an impact because you see it all well for an example um, it's an impact on you yeah it does personally. especially for some you know that you got the success stories and but then there's this, the stories that aren't so successful and that's a reality too i'll talk about this and I won't use names because they're local, but this one particular mother I had a great relationship with her and I had a great relationship with her son. He was a little bit older. And, um, and so I, I built, he was one of my favorite kids inside of mm-hmm. straight ahead. And unfortunately it ended wrong. They found him in a third floor hallway with a needle in his arm and he was dead. And so, um, you know, I am, you know, ordained pastor myself. And so to, they asked me if I would do the service. And so to sit down in the living room and, and just start to write everything out for the funeral, it's, it's gut-wrenching. You're walking in, seeing the pictures of him when he was just five, six years old in his grandfather's lap riding a lawnmower. Mm. So, um, and then there's other instances. Uh, I remember another kid that was working with and, um, you know, doing really well. And active gang member Lynn gets shot in the face twice to go visit him in a hospital 
with half his face gone, it, 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 that stuff is traumatizing. And, and then, you know, so it's, it's these things like that, that if you don't take care of yourself, self-care, counseling, you're, you're not going to be in this long. And those, unfortunately, those, 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 are, those are the realities of this work, too. No, those are real. Were there times where you said, I can't do this anymore? No, never. What, what, it's too, what there's, keeps, too much, there's too much at stake. What keeps you working with children? What keeps you when these times are, are hard? What sustains you through that? Yeah, I, th I mean, and first it, of all, I, you know, I, I heard of, it is I, my faith with God and knowing that this is my calling and my purpose. And so I, I, I rely on him and, and it, the stakes are too high. You know, it's, it's, it, it really is. It's life or death. And so, and if it's not theirs, it's going to be somebody else's. And so, um, the, the stakes are just too high and just, you get too far in it and you just, yeah. And just, you know, it's, it's one of the things it's like, what are you going to do? You're going to let rely on somebody else to do the work. Mm -hmm. You can point, oh, oh, what do you, how are you going to engage in it yourself? So I can sit on the sidelines and be a fan or I can engage in the game and I choose to engage.